Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Key Ingredient Podcast. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, a local celebrity when it comes to newscasting, local wink anchor, Lois Tomey. Lois, you're not only an amazing anchor, but you're also a very dear friend. And thanks for joining me here today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Stefan. I feel the same way about you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. I'm excited to tell your story today because I believe you're actually celebrating almost 30 years on Wink. Is Can that correct? Can you believe that? In May of this year, it'll be 30 years at Wink. Unbelievable. Congratulations. That thank is you. absolutely thank amazing. You. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lois, I've told you before, you know, whenever I'm around, people always ask me about you. I mean, everyone says, is Lois is wonderful in person as she is on air. And I always say she's even even more wonderful. So oh, thanks. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for people to kind of hear your story. Not only is this good for aspiring journalists, but also for those in the community that know you and watch you every single night and want to just get to know you better. So if you don't mind, maybe just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself. Oh, man, how far back do you want me to go? I grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. That's a good most, place to start. Most people don't know that about me, but I think it's important to say because it's where I learned hard work, the value of hard work. Okay. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin. I went to the University of Wisconsin. Um, I wanted to be a dentist, Stefan. I did not want to do this when I, when I was a kid. I didn't think, oh, gosh, I want to be on TV. I just kind of fell into it. I was taking all the pre-med classes to be a dentist, and I took a writing class. And it kind of sparked something in me. And I've always told people, you know, follow your passions. You hear that from a lot of experts, follow your passions. Sure. And I thought, gosh, I really like this. I want to know more about it. Started to take more writing, more journalism track classes and switched right then and there. Today, I sometimes think, what are you crazy? The, the <laughs> dentist hours would be a lot better than what I work, but you know what? I've done this career now for a long time and I still really, really enjoy it. So I think I made the right choice. So what were you like as a kid? I mean, were you into sports? Were you into, uh, what were your hobbies? I was into a, a lot of things. I was into sports. I played a lot of different sports. Uh, and I also was into, um, you know, plays and forensics, things like that in high school. Okay. So I did have speaking, public speaking was something I enjoyed. I wasn't scared of it. You know, I liked being out there. So that has also helped me a lot in terms of my career now. So I've done a lot of different things, a lot of variety. And I think that's one reason I like my career because I never know what the day is going to bring, what stories we're going to be covering, what's going to be. So I'm curious. I'm naturally curious about things. And I think if you're going to be a journalist or reporter, that's something you have to embrace. You have to be curious about everyone's story. And I've always had that. Yeah, I had the same curiosity. That's why we do the key ingredient. And mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. So how long ago, what age did you want to be a dentist? What was that? Where did that come I, from? Uh, in high school. Okay. In high school. Okay. And, you know, probably for the same reasons. Oh, dentists, they look like they're doing okay. They sure. look like they make a decent living. Um, uh, You know, they got... Uh, good hours. And I think I'm going to do that. And I was actually good in, in science. And I thought, mm, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take that track in college. But when I got to organic chemistry, much like anyone who's ever taken it, it was like, oh, this is the worst class I've ever taken. And I struggled and struggled. I, I managed to do okay, but I was like, wow, do I really want to do this my whole life? Well, you're lucky you did okay. Cause I took organic chemistry and uh, I could tell you it's the weed out class, right? I mean, that's <laughs> yes. the class that gets everybody. So, um, so that can, that can certainly change. So what made you change your mind? Well, it was the, it was a, it was one class. It was a writing class. And when I had my first assignment, I had to do a, you know, a writing project and I really like got excited about it. I was enjoying it. It wasn't just homework or an assignment I had to do. And that really was the spark that turned me into switching my major from pre-med to journalism. Was this your second year in college or when was it? It was my first year first in college. Year. Okay. First year. Okay. First year. So um, it was late in the year because organic chemistry, you don't usually get to, you know, till your late freshman or sophomore year, depending on what your track Correct. is or what school you're going to. And so um, it was pretty early on. Then I went, I switched, I went to University of Wisconsin at Madison and I was working at a hotel there and I was a hotel near the Capitol. And I met the general manager of a local television station. And I got up the nerve to talk to him and ask him, hey, do you have any internships? And I started working as an intern at his television station. And I think the internship is the most underused um, tool in a college student's toolbox. I agree. Because I think if you don't get a taste for what real life in that job is going to be before you graduate, you're making a mistake. 
because you may go into it after you graduate thinking, okay, I'm all ready. I'm going to be the greatest finance manager. I'm going to be the greatest HR person. I'm going to be the greatest journalist ever. And you get there and you're like, this is all there is. And it's yeah. not what you want to do. So I, I did an internship and I interned for two years and it was not easy for me because I didn't have a car. It was like, you know, two buses and a half mile walk every time I wanted to go. And remember, this is Wisconsin in the middle of winter. Pretty cold. Huh? Yeah. Terrible yeah. hours because I could only do it when I wasn't in class and I wasn't working other jobs to make money. So I, but I was committed and I'm so glad I did it because I was so prepared and that company gave me my first shot on air and I started working part-time for them and full-time for them. Wow. So, so bring you back to the internship. What were you doing? What the have you doing? I was doing just mundane things. Five o'clock like, news. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, <don't> you, <laughs> no, didn't I, I wish, no. didn't I wish? No, I was like at that time I was logging, watching satellite feeds and logging feeds and content for producers because it was way before we had everything in the palm of our hand. Sure. So they needed someone who could make make their job a little bit easier. So I was logging what's coming down on the feed, what kind of sound was available, what interviews were being done, what was the content, that kind of thing. I was even getting, you know, whatever they told me to do. I was basically doing whatever they told me to do. Sure. Until they finally let me start. I asked if I could go and sh uh, shadow a reporting team out in the field. Could I shadow a producer? Could I shadow? There's so many different careers in broadcast journalism that you aren't even aware of. I don't think one year in college that you get a feel for what's right for you. Do I want to be on air? Do I want to be off air? Do I, you know, what, what really sparks me? And so that I just started shadowing people. That's great. So you're doing this internship for how many years? How long did that two go years. for? Two, two years. years. So after two years, was that when you graduated? No, I, I was in my senior year. I was okay. in my senior year. And this is the, the pivotal moment for me. They always say there's some, some, moment that made you or or a get, key ingredient right, as we like to refer ingredient. to it on our show yes very good Stefan a yeah. key ingredient and that was a snowstorm in Wisconsin when I was there in the morning helping produce the morning news and the morning news anchor couldn't get back in time wow and I always dress the part now Stefan you hear that from experts a lot dress for the job you want not for the job you have absolutely I used to wear a, a blazer and a like a business suit when I went and interned and people might have thought, wow, this is kind of crazy. But that morning, boy, did it pay off because there was nobody there to do the morning cut ins for the newscasts. And the producer looked at me and said, you're you have to do it. And there were power outages in the in the area. It was a terrible snowstorm. Well, I got on the air. I did it. My news director got his power back in the middle of one of my cut ins for the news and saw his intern sitting there doing reading a newscast and wondering what is going on. By the time he got in, he'd calm down. He pulled me in his office and he said, you know what? You didn't do half bad. <laughs> I'm going to do, I'm going to have you do some weekend work. And that's how I got my way in. So what were you, what were you feeling when they came over to you and said, Lois, we need you now. Utter panic. Sure. Complete and utter panic. And I just talked myself into calming down. You know what you're doing. It's not like I had never done it anything before I've done, did things on our college station. We worked, our college station was the PBS station in Madison. So we had top of the line equipment. We did it just like any other station would do it. So I had a little bit of experience. I just didn't have any uh, life experience or, yeah. you know, so I was nervous as all get out. Sure. But I was so glad I was ready to go and I did it and it, it was my break. Interesting. So what happened next? When, well, I became, um, they started letting me produce more. I started going out on weekends, reporting some some stories. And eventually when I graduated, I applied for a, a job in Green Bay and I got a full-time job working in Green Bay. So so what's it like being a reporter outside of the studio versus inside? I mean, what's, what's, what's the difference? I mean, um, there's, well, it's a lot, there's a lot of excitement outside the studio. The studio, inside the studio, you know, you're there, you're reporting news, different stories every day, but you're right. always in the studio outside. You, you don't know what you're going to happen upon or what you're going to be seeing that day, which keeps it very, very exciting. And it's fun. If you like people being out in the field is a lot of fun because you meet a lot of people, you get a lot of stories. You, you, you're, it's a constant, a constant change of stories and people. And it just it keeps it exciting every single day. So at what point did you come down here to Southwest Florida? Well, I was working in Green Bay. Okay. And 
again, weird circumstances The I was filling in for an anchor who had a liver transplant. She was off the air for a year. Oh, wow. So they took me from the job I had been doing and they put me in the main chair for a year to fill in for her. She was about to come back. And I realized that that, that day, wait a second, the position I had had been filled. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Right. And it just so happened, Wink called me that week and said, hey, we have a position we'd like you to intern for or we'd like you to interview for. And I Wink, where's Wink? I mean, has, have Fort had you Myers, been down Fort to Myers? Fort Myers at no, that time? Or no, I had no okay. idea. I got up, got out the map and looked where Fort Myers was. And sure. I was like, wow, okay, this looks okay. This looks good. I came down and interviewed and I really liked it here. I really loved the station. And, you know, it was fortuitous for me. I was, it was good timing and I was hired to be the, the main anchor for Wink. And that was in 1992, 1992, correct? 1992. So when you came down here, so did you, were you doing the, the nightly news or what was your schedule? Like? I was doing the 5.30, 6 and 11 okay. at that time. Okay. Um, we've expanded newscasts. We have so many more newscasts than we ever had yeah, now. Three o'clock now, yeah. right? Oh, I mean, you've yes, added a lot. Yes, yeah. the morning yeah. show too is doing an incredible amount of news in the morning. Yeah. Um, the appetite for news in Southwest Florida is tremendous, which is why it's done this way here. But right now I'm doing the 5, the 6 and the 7 o'clock newscasts and um, really, really love it. You know, I'm, 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 I'm riding a wave that's been a long, long wave and I'm really enjoying myself. That's a good schedule for you as well. Cause you have a family, right? You have a that's husband right. and two children. And so what is a typical day like for Lois Tommy? Well, so, uh, you know, I don't necessarily have to be in the studio till about noon. Okay. Okay. But before noon, I could be doing any number of things. I could be here talking to someone like you, Stefan. I could be at an event hosting something. I could be working a story. I do a lot of reporting still, you know, when I can. And so I could, be, I'm out usually shooting those things in the morning prior to my work day, because once I get into the studio, it's, I'm pretty much off to the races. Sure. Um, it's not just what you see on the TV every every night. It's uh, promotions, shooting things for them, shooting things for for our radio stations. We have like you know eight or nine radio stations in the building, and I'm doing radio newscasts throughout the day for them. So it's like it's kind of a constant. There's always another deadline, and it's kind of how I work. I work very segmented. You know, some people have long term projects. Ours aren't like that. It's like what do I have this hour? What, what deadline do I have to meet in the next 10 minutes? Right. You know, we work that way a lot throughout the day in television news. And so that keeps it exciting, too. You always sure. have to stay right on top of the next. Well, the every next day deadline. is different for you, which is terrific, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to news stories. So yeah. so it's pretty typical, I think, at least in this market, from what I've noticed, is that you have anchors kind of come for a few years, usually about three years or so. Yes. And then they go to a different market. So it is unusual to have someone like yourself say that they're celebrating 30 years here. The very obvious question is, what keeps you here, Lois? Well, I think a while ago, Stefan, I recognized that I could climb the ladder. I could go to a bigger station. I've had other offers in bigger markets, or I could stay in this community and make a difference in my community. And not every television market can you do that. If you go to Miami, and you, the, the, event, the things you do outside of the station, off the air, raising money for charities, whatever it may be, are not as significant as what you could do in this community. Sure. It really depends on who lives here and what what's important to them. And so I recognized very early in Southwest Florida that I could make a difference by supporting things that I'm passionate about. And I could become a, a productive member of this community, not just somebody's news anchor, but that I could really make a difference in people's lives as well. Because of the um, notoriety, I guess you would say I have just sure. from working on television. And so I decided that's what I wanted to do. I would rather make a difference than climb the ladder of corporate television. Well, you certainly are making a difference. I mean, I know your involvement in the community is incredible outside of the studio. So I guess just for our listeners and viewers, what are some of the top two or three things that you're involved in right now? Well, listen, right now, I'm just about ready to kick off the, our March to a Million Meals, which is a major fundraiser that we do every single year for the Harry Chapin Food Bank. Yes. Before that, it was the Wink Hunger Walk, but it's evolved in the pandemic into an into an on air and online, you know, fundraising platform. And so that involves doing a month's worth of, of stories to let people know what's happening in our community. And that's probably one of the ones that I'm most passionate about because, you know, we're raising 
vital money to feed families who are in need. And there is so much need out there right now. I wish I could say it was getting better, but it is not. It's amazing. And I don't think it's going to get any better. And Stefan, I know you've been very, very involved in that. You've been a supporter of that, the Wink Hunger Walk, and now March to a Million Meals for years as well. So you know why I'm so passionate about it. I do. Well, you got me involved in that. I mean, it's an absolutely great cause. And like you and I have said before, nobody should be hungry. Uh, especially children, right? I mean, it's terrible, mm -hmm. terrible to see that. So it's it's a great cause that you're involved in. Yeah, children are definitely the the reason I got involved in the first place and why I'm so passionate about it. But now, you know, when I look at the at the statistics, it's working families. Amazing. I mean, we have to be aware that a lot of these people, I think people have in their brain that the person who's hungry is someone who's sitting on the side of the road with a sign. And yes, okay, that person is hungry, but the majority, the vast majority of the people that are being served at these mobile food pantries that I volunteer at on a regular basis, so this is how I know what's, and I talk to people there, sure. they're working. They're working, but they can't make ends meet because either they're working in the service industry or, unfortunately, teachers, uh, first responders, people who have families who can't make ends meet because rents are so high and now food is so costly. Well, everything's going up right now, so it doesn't make it any easier. That's You're exactly right. right. That's right. So, you know, that's that's one of the big ones for me, Stefan. What else? I what I else? I know you difference. have a couple of others that you're involved well, in. Well, I have, I you know, I do uh, different types of children's charities. I also do... Um, uh, uh, the reading Southwest Florida Reading Festival. I've I been involved that. on that for for. Uh, let's see, that's gonna. Go, we're going on 1999. Is was it the first really? One. Wow. Was well, you're a committed one. person. Everything you do, you stick with for a very long time. Yeah, that 1999 was the first one for that. So that's amazing. We're gonna be almost 25 years. It's like crazy how how much time flies. Wow. You know, and I also do things for different charities. You know, all over South Florida, I could name a, a bunch of, of different course. ones, but it's it's just it's something that I can do, and you know, emceeing someone's event, you know, uh, it, it's easy for me to do that. Sure, and it can make a big difference. So I love to do it. Wow. So, what are your favorite your favorite part really about being a news anchor? What do you love most about it? Um, how different every single day is. I think I love that because it just keeps it fresh. You know, you people, you know, sometimes you get into your career and you're like, oh, the same thing over and over and over again. Most careers are like that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you can change it just with your attitude. Sometimes you can change it by doing a new project with on air television. It changes for you. Yeah. You don't need to do that. So that's one thing. If I if anyone was thinking about getting into this career, you also have to be good at adaptability. Because it's not going to be the way you want it to be. You know, we have producers every day. They work all day putting together this one-hour newscast, right? They got it all set up. It's beautiful. It's tied up in a little bow just the way they like it. And then something happens and breaks, and they have to throw the whole thing out and start all over again. Yeah. So if you aren't good at adapting, then this isn't a career for you. Because that's something that's vital to succeed, in this, in this business. Sure. So for someone looking right now, listening to, to this podcast saying, you know, that sounds interesting. something I think I might want to explore. Mm -hmm. What do you advise they do? I advise they think about what the world's going to look like in 10 or 15 years, because my industry changes constantly. And it's not just the technology, but right now it's how do you watch TV? Um, I have two teenagers who barely watch any local television at, at all. So I worry, what what's my job going to be like when they become the key demographic? Sure. When they're 35, 40, 50, is it going to be the same way it is now or is it going to be something completely different? Are we going to go to completely on-demand television and or is it going to stay how it is, appointment TV where you sit down every night at 6 o'clock and watch the local news? You know, when our, when our parents were younger... Yeah. It was, they called it appointment viewing. The entire world sat down to watch the network news. It was on that time of day and everybody was watching it. Well, the network network news stations are suffering because you sure. can get everything in the pocket of your hand right now on your phone. So, you know, do I need that anymore? I think local news still has a niche. I think we still need to turn to local news for when important things are happening, not just, you know, like, for example, take hurricanes or the recent tornadoes, you know, you need to, you need a local source you can turn to right now when something critical is happening or your safety is at risk and to learn about local stories that are, have an impact on you. You still need local news, but I think we have to be prepared 
to adapt as well. So if someone was looking at this as a career, sit down and think about how you use TV now and what will it look like in 20 years before you decide to do it? Because your career is going to be a lot longer than that. That's interesting. Well, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen so many changes over the, the 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I've always noticed is obviously there, there are those of you who are on camera. Those are the ones we see, but there are so many outstanding professionals behind the scenes. Oh my goodness. And, yes. and I would imagine, and you tell me that's evolved as well. So with everything becoming more digital, social media, posting on social media, that's created additional jobs for those who are interested. So if someone is not comfortable, maybe being on camera, uh, there's so many more opportunities. So what does that look like for them? Oh, there's so many. You're right. Dig our digital team is growing. That's something you can do if you like to, if you want to be involved in writing stories, posting stories, posting video, letting people know what's going on so they can learn some, about something directly from you. Digital, being working on a digital team is a great, great job. The producing team, that is still a career that is going crazy. There are not enough of them. Mm. You can pretty much still write your own ticket. If I wanted to go as an anchor to a specific city, it might take me years and years and years to work my way into that city. Sure. As a producer, it's a completely different ball game. There's so much need for producers that if you can get some experience under your belt so you get good at your craft, you can then still write your own ticket if you want to target a certain section of the country or even a certain city, and you can still get there. So becoming a producer, which means you're building the newscast, timing it out, writing stories, gathering information from crews in the field, getting it all and weaving it all together and getting it on the air. You are the one in charge while it's on the air. All the anchors wait for direction from you. And, you know, it's a high pressure job. Sure it is. But there is a lot of security in it right now. And I don't see that changing for many years to come. It's an exciting job. Uh, you know, I know some of the producers at Wink and they're always moving around and trying to, like you said, they change things on a dime if they need to. That's right. And That's everything, right. I don't think people realize how everything is planned out really to the second. Absolutely. Right? Has Which to is be. amazing. Yeah. Has to be. Yeah. Has yeah. to be. You know, the pay bills are paid by the advertisements. You don't want to, you got to be right on time all the time. So if you're good with detail, if detail is your strength, that's a that's definitely that's a job. career to think about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what do you like least about what you do? I like least uh, working holidays, um, weekends, you know, mm -hmm. some of the odd hours. News is 24-7. That gets old as you get older and you have kids who are involved in activities and you want to be there. Well, guess what? If the uh, activity for my daughter at school is at 5 o'clock, the news is five o'clock. Yeah. So I'm not making that. So I, 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 that's my least favorite thing. I have, you have a little bit less flexibility in this job as a result of that. You can't move around the newscast to suit your schedule. So that's probably my least favorite thing. Interesting. What about some of the stories you've had to report over the years? I and mean, I'm sure there've been some that uh, as a parent, maybe don't make you feel so good when you report them. And I would imagine that has to be very, very difficult. Yeah. I'm, I've, I've, traveled a lot in the early years when we were traveling a lot more. Um, I went to Columbine t three different times um, after the Columbine shooting. That was a wow. very, very difficult story to report. Um, went to the Oklahoma City bombing uh, the day that occurred. Um, another one that really impacted me and kind of changed my perspective on things is um, in the late early to mid 90s I went out on a Coast Guard cutter with the U.S. Coast Guard in the Florida Straits and we were picking up Cubans who are on makeshift rafts trying to get from Cuba to the United States, trying to get their children out of the country. And um, I think what changed my perspective there was I didn't really know anyone who was Cuban. I didn't understand the desperation. I didn't know what would make someone sacrifice potentially sacrifice their li their own life and their children's lives to get out of a country and come here. I didn't realize how great we had it really mm -hmm. until then when I met a family and with an interpreter was able to understand why they were so desperate to get out of the circumstances they were. Wow. And, and then I realized they want the same thing I do. I want my children to be in a better place than I was. That's all they wanted. I want to create a world where my child can do better than I did. And so, you know, it's all about your life experiences, right? Sure. And your perspective. Well, that story, I was with the Coast Guard for about 10 days. That, that changed my perspective a lot. I'm sure it did. Sometimes we need a little bit of a reminder of mm -hmm. how good we have it. That's right.
Yeah, that's, that's right. interesting. Mm -hmm. Lois, as we kind of conclude here a little bit, I mean, is there is there something you think that our audience doesn't know about you that maybe they would like, like what kind of hobbies do you have? I and mean, what do you do, I guess, in your spare time? I say that loosely, but. Well, most of the time, mostly I'm just trying to spend time with my family. Sure. You know, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm very much a homebody on the weekends. Do you like to cook? I like, like to cook. Okay. My husband's okay. a great cook too. Okay. So I, I, I like to eat his cooking <laughs> even more than cooking <laughs> even, myself. Tastes even better, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. I'm very involved in my church. People may not know that. Okay. I read, I read at church. Um, um, I, I, I love spending time with my kids and that's getting harder and harder as they become more and more independent as teenagers. Um, I like to travel. My family's in Wisconsin and we like to go, I like to go to Wisconsin and visit them as often as I can. Sure. Um, you know, I do, I, I guess I'm, I'm a normal person just like everyone else. Absolutely. You know, I love my weekends because I love work, but my gosh, it's really nice to enjoy your family and just have time off too. So you never know when you run into me, say hi. That's another <laughs> thing people don't know. Some people will come up to you and they'll say, Oh, I know I don't want to bother you. Listen, it's no bother at all. Um, I, I love people. You know, I love I know to you do. meet people yeah. and see them and understand them. Even if it's a critical, even if it's something they want to, a critical comment they want to pass along. I like to know where people live. Sure. You know, it's part of being good at telling a story is understanding where people live. And so, you know, I, I just, I just love the job because of that. I, I'm a big believer in everything happens for a reason. And there was a reason you came down here, right? Because there was so many great things you could, you would be able to do down here. Just tell us real quickly, how'd you meet your husband? I met my husband at Wink. Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. I met him there. <laughs> um, he worked there. We worked together for about almost four years. Um, and then he took a job at another company and we got engaged uh, shortly after that. Um, got married about a year later and he's still working in, in television and film production. Um, he's got a quite an exciting career. You know, he gets to go different, all different places and cover all different kinds of things. Um, but he's his own, uh, own boss, which is great. Excellent. He's got some good flexibility that way. And so he understands the demands of my job and that's why it works so well. Cause I think if I was married to someone who wasn't in the industry or who had never been in the industry, I think it's kind of hard. The families sure. have to make a sacrifice when mom can't be there at 6 PM to eat dinner with everybody. Some families wouldn't work well with that. You're but right. My husband's a very understanding, loving guy, and I'm I'm very, very blessed to have him in my life. How many years have you been married? Now? We've been married 22 years now. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Amazing story, Lois. Listen, I want to thank you for your time today. Um, thank you for telling your story so that our listeners and viewers can get to know you better. And thank you for all the amazing work you do down here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Stefan. It's great. It's been a pleasure. This is a great podcast. I'm very happy for your success. Thank you so much. Thanks again for joining us.